It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Um, a number of you are aware of a term, very enduring term, called the Sturgis Mafia. Uh, it had to do with the National Guard and the military service, and I'm very proud to introduce our speaker as a part of that Sturgis Mafia. It included people like uh, Chris Meckling, Dwayne Quayle, um, Bob Grams uh, here, Oh, there are several others. I know I'm, I'm missing some of them. But one of them was our very own David Super. And he was fortunate to be stationed, or at least he considers himself fortunate to have been stationed in Washington, D.C. for uh, many, many years. And he's had an illustrious career in the, in the National Guard, serving uh, our nation in Washington for 31 years? We lived there for 31 years. Live, okay, that's, that's a long time. So, David is also a member of our Sturgis Mekai Historical Society. As many of you have heard, we lost uh, a very avid uh, historian, Charles Rambo, the other night. And uh, we just received word from Mark Rambo that the memorial for uh, Chuck will be to the Sturgis Mee County Historical Society. So any donations uh, that would be made in his name would go to our organization. So thank you in advance for those contributions. Without further ado, I would like you to welcome uh, David Super. Well, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm David Super. I'm a retired National Guardsman. I, I qualified barely as a junior uh, altar boy for the Sturgis Mafia because uh, I, I left here um, in 1983 and went to the headquarters of the Guard in Washington, D.C. And, and stayed there for way longer than we thought we would end up staying, and, but came home and uh, happy for that and uh, to settle back into familiar surroundings with friends and uh, new friends that we've made since we've lived here uh, back in, in town. We live in Rapid City, but my heart's always here in Sturgis. And my next door neighbor uh, are Kip and Linda Matkins. So uh, Sturgis people are never far away from us uh, one way or another. So today, we're going to talk about when the, the History Society decided to use Trails to Sturgis as the theme for this year's Sturgis History Day. Why, in the back of my mind, um, I'd always thought about doing some kind of a story, a recollection or whatever, of the road construction industry. Um, I and my sister Virginia and our older sister Mary Ann, who uh, lives in Illinois, uh, we grew up in a road construction family. Our dad, Ed Kroll, was a longtime employee of Northwestern Engineering Company and later uh, the Simon Construction Company. And so in our house, uh, our dear mother just thought that diesel fuel was a fabric softener because that was just part of our life. And uh, asphalt on my dad's shoes, uh, well, yeah, it's here, you know. He didn't take his boots off, you know. That was, that was a that was a part of his life, as was his hard hat uh, and his Red Cross certification card that he carried later in his wallet. But anyway, that those are those are just family stories that I can talk about forever and ever. Um, but I'm serious about the diesel fuel as a fabric software. And I tried to pitch that line to a number of people that I know who are songwriters, thinking there's got to be a country western tune in that. Uh, nobody's taking me up on it, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll never be well known for that, I guess. So, footpaths to the interstate. Here we go with, at some time in unrecorded history, why the earliest humans who were here followed the animal tracks that went up and down the creeks and the, uh, the sheltered spots 
always looking for something that was downhill instead of uphill. Uh, we're all humans after all, seeking an easy path to things. And that set the stage for what we use today in, in the road network that's here. And once the rumors of gold in the Black Hills were validated by the Custer expedition and other explorers who came here and said, yep, there's gold here, and my hunch is there's a lot of gold here. Uh, come and get it, boys. And well, once that happened, we, it's another six semester course to teach the history of how uh, the land came, changed ownership, the treaty rights, all of that <laughs> kind of stuff. Um, that, that's a whole other story. But when the people came, starting with Custer in 74, then the gold rush, 75, 76, uh, they had Katie bar the door. I mean, people were coming here, miners were coming here, all the support staff that were coming here. And so the trails, the animal trails, the footpaths and the like got changed into more or less the roads that we use today, or at least the rights of way. And these were trails of good intentions, mostly. They could lead to opportunity, professional and personal success, and when you would least expect it, heartache. And that's what I'm going to talk about today and how uh, things have evolved. The dreamers who came here wanted to find gold. The realists who came with them or followed on not long after were the people that wanted to make money from the dreamers. And that relationship has existed since the very beginning. And, uh, I don't know that there's anybody in the sound booth who can do that, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. Um, and so how did the goods and services get here? Well, by 1876, the major cities in the region that had freight rail operations started competing to become the place to launch their freight wagon services. The earliest starting points were Cheyenne, Sydney, Bismarck. Sioux City and Yankton were players, but things worked a little differently there. The freight would come to Cheyenne, Sydney, and Bismarck, got loaded onto wagons, and then brought here to the Black Hills. In Sioux City and Yankton, the freight largely was offloaded to steamships, and then the steamships came upriver to Fort Pier. The goods and services were unloaded at Fort Pier, put on the wagon trains, and then made the trip to the Black Hills. The Fort Pier to Deadwood Trail became the most heavily traveled and lasted from 1876 to 1906. The trip took 15 days, plus or minus one way, Typically, there were three wagons in a group, and then 30 wagons made up the wagon train. And that's how the dynamite, the parts for the railroad that were, the narrow gauge railroads that were built here in the Northern Hills, they had to be hauled here on freight wagons. Um, the groceries, the gold pans, the picks and shovels, the whiskey, whatever else it took, the gunpowder, uh, to make the Black Hills work all came on these freight wagons. And day after day, kind of around the calendar, and they didn't operate in really bad weather conditions, but the, the freighters were just, they just never quit back and forth, back and forth with um, their goods that they were bringing to the Black Hills. The, uh, by 1879, there was an improved trail from Deadwood to Sturgis, and that was surveyed in 1879. And in some manner or another, a road down Boulder Canyon was proposed, and that would shorten the trip from Deadwood to Sturgis by seven miles. You didn't have to go through Whitewood. You just could come down Boulder Canyon. And in 79, there also was a lot of discussion about building a road from Galena to Sturgis. And this road got built, and it was built as a toll road initially, as was 
the Boulder Canyon route, a toll road. Um, there was a man named George Shingle. He was a liveryman here in Sturgis in 1879. And he had come to Deadwood a couple of years earlier. And he was appointed the road supervisor. And so had oversight of the toll roads and the other improved trails that were uh, starting to be built out in the Black Hills. Uh, he was named in a road maintenance and financing controversy uh, in 1881. There was, when you read the newspaper accounts, there was lots of squabbles and complaints and lawsuits and who knows what else over the toll roads and the maintenance of the roads, that people weren't doing enough. That I paid 10 cents to drive my wagon on the toll road. Where did that 10 cents go? Uh, you know, the toll road operators must be millionaires by now, because we're all paying a dime or 25 cents, or whatever the fee was to ride on the toll road. Um, another guy who did operate the toll road from Deadwood to Sturgis was a man named John Gilman, and his toll road operated in one way or another from 1877 to 1891. And bit by bit, these toll roads got shorter um, when the local citizens and the county governments would just say, ah, oh, we just, this toll deal just isn't working anymore, and we're going to take it over and just run it as a public road. And uh, when Gilman died, um, the county finally settled. It took several years, but they paid a claim of $300 to his widow for the last stretch of the toll road that she still was part of his estate. And uh, on his death, his uh, estate was worth $10,000. And uh, that's $330,000 in today's money. Well, if you own a single family house in churches these days, your estate's probably worth 300K, uh, plus or minus. So was, was he a rich man? No, but certainly I'm sure you know, he, he, uh, he paid his way and, uh, and all of that. And one of his daughters, he and his wife had eight children, one of his daughters married I.H. Chase, who became the retail uh, Baron here in Sturgis with the Chase's store and all that. So when you delve into the early history of Sturgis, you, it, it, it is inseparable from that of Lee and Deadwood. Uh, they were in the same county, uh, and so what passed for government in those days was managed out of the courthouse in Deadwood, um, and the relationships of families, businesses, and people were all <coughs> intertwined uh, between those communities. Sturgis, <coughs> Belfouche, Rapid City, they all had their own orbits, but Sturgis was really solidly connected to the Lee Deadwood area. Now, as the territorial government got more established and the county government got more sophisticated and the like, there became more effective ways to levy taxes and collect taxes and hire the staff, the road maintainers and all of that to uh, make things work here so that commerce and socializing and whatever else could take place um, between the houses, or between the towns rather. And so by the time that Carl Benz had invented his first automobile in Germany and the Duryea brothers in the United States had the first automobile, Henry Ford kind of cracked the puzzle with the invention of the development of the Model T. 850 bucks you could buy a car. And that was an affordable vehicle for a lot of families that were here, whether they were miners, merchants, farmers, ranchers, or whatever. The Model T very quickly became part of the, the mixture of what went on here. Um, the state government finally got involved and set a speed limit. 20 miles an hour, and that held for just a couple of years. Two years later, it was raised to 25. But remember, there were no regularly graveled roads anywhere in South Dakota then. So 25 miles an hour is probably about as fast as you'd want to go on a dirt road um, 
in good weather. And uh, that was the standard for uh, a good long while. State politics uh, quickly played a role in the development of the highway system. There was a forerunner of the Highway Commission created in 1913. And then in 1916, there was a constitutional amendment that enabled the state to construct public roads. And then the following year, there was something called the Good Roads Law that was passed. And uh, the people at the resident engineer office in Rapid City of the South Dakota Department of Transportation, they still talk about the Good Roads Law. It's kind of the birthday of the state highway department and the road network that we know today. They authorized, they first authorized a, um, this was a, this, just as an aside, this is a picture of some early road building equipment uh, that's in the collection of photographs that are in the residence engi resident engineer's office in Rapid City. Uh, it's a, kind of a big tractor pulling a uh, road grader, um, the patrol as it was called. And our dad, who came along in his career as a road builder in the early 1950s, was his job title still was patrol operator. They, it was a grader, but it was a patrol, and that was that machine behind the, the tractor there uh, did the grading. <clears throat> the uh, but the Good Roads Commission, the important milestone that they the lawmakers, the state legislators put together was that they authorized a system of state highways. Kind of laid, they laid down the map that we utilize today in, in many, many respects. There have been lots of little right-of-way adjustments and twists and turns taken out of the, these, uh, these highways over the decades. But this was the system that was uh, created in uh, 1916 with the, or 1917 with the Good Roads Law, and in the legislation that they authorized, they created this system of highways that would connect every county seat, regardless of its size, uh, with the other parts and pieces of the road network, and any town that was 750 people or more <coughs> would be connected to the state highway system. So um, Sturgis qualified on two years. By, by then, uh, Sturgis was a county seat, and so it had earned a place in the state road network, and certainly the population of Sturgis in 1916 was about uh, 750. In modern day South Dakota, there are some counties that struggle. They couldn't meet, said they couldn't find 750 uh, people in the county seat town on the 4th of July, you know, with free beer and pizza or whatever. And they're just, the towns are, the places like Buffalo and the like are, uh, but they are county <coughs> seats, and so they still have their place uh, in the road network, certainly. I heard a story just yesterday about uh, the precarious financial circumstances that some counties are in, the very small counties. Um, that uh, the, the monster of consolidation of counties is, it's always been out there and it's provided for in state law, but the reality of consolidating some of these uh, counties with small, much, much smaller populations, uh, in our lifetimes, we're going to be hearing about that. Yet. Uh, I don't know how much a road grader costs these days, but does every county need a fleet? of highway equipment, can they share equipment? And some counties are already doing that. So, um, one of the other reasons for the state to create a highway commission was by the early teens, there was the federal highway system. And the federal highway system really meant federal money. And so in order to qualify for matching funds, and the like, why the state was pretty much, they, there was no way out of it. You had to have some kind of a legal mechanism 
to manage your road network so that you could take advantage of the federal dollars. And uh, we South Dakotans are, we are the masters of that mechanism for getting things paid for here in our state. And um, it, a lot of it started back then, and the highway network and system was a big part of it. Not long after the Highway Commission was created, the road network, at least the, on paper, was laid down before Mount Rushmore was started. Why the tourism industry in the nation was interested for not only for tourism but for business reasons in getting people moved mostly east to west across the, the nation. And so these trails, trail systems were created. And the Black and Yellow Trail, which roughly followed the Fort Pier to, to Deadwood uh, Ox Trail path, uh, was established. And that road started in Chicago, or the trail, and went to Yellowstone Park. The headquarters of the, it, the administration for all that was in Hearing for many, many years. And um, it was a, a mechanism of raising money and awareness. And just like small towns in South Dakota and elsewhere uh, put on their best dress and perfume to get the railroad to come to town, so did these trail promotion uh, organizations uh, do everything they could. They had dinners, <coughs> guest speakers. Uh, they would organize uh, car caravans. Uh, so let's let's take a tr let's take a ride on the Black and Yellow Trail, for instance, and see just how good our roads are here in South Dakota. You know, you really can get from Sioux Falls to the Black Hills to Yellowstone Park. Just follow the Black and Yellow. Bands, that was the GPS of the day. These, that, this brand, this black over yellow and black, was painted on fence posts and utility poles um, across the nation. And that's how you found your way. And of course, uh, when you're going 25 miles an hour uh, and you have flat tires, if you're lucky, maybe two, three times a week, uh, you're going to stop. And that's part of what it was all about. These trail network organizations were encouraging um, business and getting people to come and stay overnight, stay two days, three days, move to our town, uh, whatever the reasons. Uh, there were big economic engines driving a lot of this. The uh, Custer Battlefield Trail was another uh, trail, and that was essentially Highway 16 or Interstate 90 today. Went from Sioux Falls through Mitchell Chamberlain um, into the Black Hills and beyond. The Yellowstone Trail, which this is the Black and Yellow Trail, was the northern route. Um, and there was, a, there was at least one north-south route that went through South Dakota. And it was called the King of Trails. And it went from Winnipeg all the way to the Texas Gulf Coast. And today, in South Dakota, it's Interstate 29. Uh, and so it, it was everywhere. Um, politicians played important roles in all of this as well, as various town boosters uh, would get together with each other to see how they could cooperate or compete against each other for state and federal money to improve a road, to get it graveled, eventually to get it paved. Um, We've all, people our generation, and uh, there's young people here, maybe somebody, there might be someone here a little bit older than me. Um, we've all heard, heard the stories of how the Houston family had enough political muscle to change the footpath of Interstate 90 to be closer to Wall. The engineers wanted, engineers do what engineers do, path of least resistance, uh, cheapest path, easiest path, and the Houston family and others in Wall got a look at the proposed uh, footprint for Interstate 90 and said, oh, no, sorry, we're, 
we're moving the road a little closer to wall. And so it, uh, that was one of the first state legislative uh, legends I heard 50 years ago, is the, hor the political horsepower, the muscle of the Houston family to influence that. Well, that's one example that still lives on. It went on everywhere. And it still goes on with uh, the way roads are cited, if not for the path that they take for improvements. Who gets it first? Um, you didn't build the bridge big enough. We want a better bridge. Uh, all those things are all intertwined with local decision makers, state decision makers, and federal decision makers, because everybody's got a, a little piece of the of the action and how that goes along. <clears throat> One of the kingmakers in all of this was a, a guy named Chester Leadham, who was from either Belvedere or Kadoka. He was one of the very first state highway commissioners, the senior political appointee on the State Highway Commission. And he was here in the Black Hills in 1922 working with the other business people of Sturgis and Lee Deadwood to uh, get the road from Sturgis to Rapid City graveled for the first time. Because prior to that, prior to the early 20s, it was on a good day a uh, three and a half hour ride from Sturgis to Rapid City. So you didn't go there for lunch. Uh, necessarily. And you could take the train to Rapid. So if you really had to get there, didn't want to drive, uh, there were other alternatives. This picture, on the, the color picture on the right, is a little piece of Highway 1479, the Sturgis Road, that we would have grown up with as kids. Um, it's the Snyder Ranch today, it's their bull pasture, and you can see nature is um, bit by bit by bit taking back the road. But this goes on, and for my recollection, that's probably the shortest, or, or rather the straightest section of the old Highway 14 um, from the road from Sturgis to, um, to Rapid City. And now it's, you know, it's just a ranch road, and so it's pretty much just one track. But it was a two-lane road. Um, that had its hazards, I'll talk about that here in, in just a minute. Um, and going back to nature, and 50 feet from where I took this picture, Interstate 90 is just vroom, 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 all day and all night long. And so a, a very, very busy thoroughfare these days. Liam came to town and advocated for this um, graveling of the road. In 1922, bids were open for graveling a portion of the Sturgis to Rapid City Road. 17 contractors bid, and their, their offer was between 41,000 to 49,000. A fellow named Eugene Parrish uh, won the bid for the portion from Sturgis to Piedmont. And the work was done in 1923. Um, South Dakota had a lot of cars on the road, even in the early 20s. The great distances that we live with here, uh, not so many people uh, and the like, just mandated the purchase of a lot of vehicles, particularly automobiles. Light trucks were available, but they weren't popular like they are today. Where you can't vote if you don't own a club cab pickup that costs $90,000. Know, how can you be a citizen without one? And uh, the uh, I've got a 20 year old pickup, so I sneak on I'm grandfathered in, I guess, some way or another. And I haven't been turned away at the polls yet, you know. Um, but just as an example, in 1928, um, there were 272 motor vehicles registered per 1,000 population in South Dakota. The national average was 2004. So even in early day state of South Dakota, uh, you had to have a car. You had to have some kind of a vehicle to get from here to there. Um, 
Another important milestone that came along was the uh, state cement plant. And we all grew up hearing about Peter Norbeck, the state legislator, governor, state or U.S. senator. He was an important guy in early days, South Dakota. Um, and so he and members of the legislature created the state cement plant. And that took a constitutional amendment uh, in order for state government to get involved. Um, and the authorization was in 1918. And it, took, and it took several years to build the cement plant. So by 1924, the first barrels of cement uh, and why cement is measured by the barrel, I don't know, but that's how they count it. Uh, the first barrels of cement came out of the state cement plant in 24. They've been using it ever since. The Janklo administration, another powerful governor, uh, comes along and convinces the state legislature to sell the state cement plant to an international firm that's headquartered in Mexico. And the revenue from the sale of the cement plant went into a uh, trust fund, and that earns about $14 million a year, which is plus or minus, depending on the variables of the economy and the like, what the state cement plant, when it was state-owned, turned about $14 million a year back into the state treasury. So um, the dollars have stayed essentially the same. But the factory in Rapid City uh, is no longer owned by the citizens of South Dakota. For better or for worse, that's the way it is. And it's still dusty. And it, oh, it'll never stop being a dusty place. Um, after the economic blush of the Roaring Twenties, there came South Dakota's rural credit difficulties. That was 40 years every year in the state legislature of um, coming up with money to pay off the bad debts from the rural credit scandal of the 1920s. The Great Depression, the Dust Bowl, then World War II, all of these things came along to have an impact on road building in, across South Dakota and certainly here as well. During um, World War II, for, or during the Depression, for instance, there were no state dollars given over to highway construction. No new roads were built. Uh, there were roads built, but those were built with federal dollars uh, under the WPA program. Uh, and then when World War II started, there was no more road construction until the end of the war. But by 1944, the state was getting ready to tackle the, the tide of the war was changing. The Allied forces were going to win. Um, and uh, the states were getting ready to, geez, we got this big backlog of road maintenance and road construction that needs to be addressed. So the Federal Highway Act was passed in 1944. One is passed nearly every year. It's kind of like the Farm Bill. There's a Federal Highway Act that gets passed. But in 1944, $3.2 billion were, uh, ad were allocated for three years of post-war construction. So they set the money aside. The war ended. It was ready to go. The money was there. And uh, lots of GIs coming home from the war our dad included, needed jobs. And so road construction became the go-to, one of the go-to industries uh, for employment. And uh, so this 3.2 billion got allocated. And then there was matching money put up as well. And in, in South Dakota, for an instance, in 1953, the state put up $26 million. And uh, by 1965, that had raised to $70 million. And a lot of that was matching money for the interstate highway system that was being built. Uh, and that money, the federal part of the interstate highway system, was all 
run through the Department of Defense cash register. Uh, those, those were defense projects, and there was the Eisenhower interstate system uh, and all of that. So it's just part of the political intrigue that it took in order to get things done uh, and to get the highway built. Um, back in South Dakota and in the legislature, the state could never convince the voters uh, or enough state legislators to sell highway construction bonds. It just, there's, it just didn't do it. And so uh, money raised for highway construction and the like uh, largely comes from gasoline taxes. And in South Dakota, when we buy fuel these days, just for gasoline, I didn't, I didn't dig up the numbers for diesel fuel and ethanol and all the other things, just for gasoline. It's 30 cents a gallon state and 18.3 cents for federal. And that money just comes right, we pay it at the pump. And that's, that helps to fund highway uh, construction and maintenance. Um, South Dakota's state tax of 30 cents is about in the middle of the nation. Um, in Pennsylvania, um, where there are no level roads, they all go up and down, it seems like to me anyway, the state tax is 61.1 cents a gallon. So uh, fill up when you're in Ohio or West Virginia, drive across Pennsylvania, and then the gas will be a little cheaper in Maryland and Virginia and uh, elsewhere. The cheapest state gas tax is Alaska, uh, 8.95 cents a gallon. So that's, that sets the early stage for everyone. Um, the political mechanism had to be put into place, tax collection, um, the construction industry had to kind of grow up and create mechanisms that would allow for the construction and maintenance of state highways. The lobbying went on by city councils, county commissions, state legislators, uh, influential citizens of the state for the pecking order of getting roads built and maintained. Early on, I talked a little bit about how the roads uh, largely provide us with convenience and opportunity and recreation and you, know, you name it. But they also provide, sadly, uh, instances of heartache. And one that had people in Sturgis particularly, I know all of the Black Hills for that matter, talking for years, was an accident in 1935. The Great Depression was still going on. The CCC camps <coughs> were set up everywhere in the nation and certainly the Black Hills had its share of CCC camps. And a special category camp got created at the little town of Kelsite, which is just west of Tilford, a few miles up into the, into the timber. And that camp, uh, officially it was R17, Company 1784, whatever that means. That's how it was tracked in the books anyway. Uh, 285 men, unlike most of the CCC camps that were populated by young men, teenagers and young men who were single, this camp at Kelsite was expressly designed to accommodate married men who were enrolled in the CCC program and their families. And so the camp was, um, Oh, 285 people. There were 150 children at the camp, and 80 of them were of school age. And they kind of all arrived, mostly from East River communities in South Dakota. They all kind of arrived in one big wave. Well, that just overwhelmed the Tilford school system. And Sturgis was too far away. Piedmont was almost too far away, and the folks of Tilford just dug in and said, sorry, we don't have the money or the space to accommodate these children. 
um, they're going to have to go to school someplace else. And so Piedmont, the school district in Piedmont said, we'll take them. They had some excess capacity somehow in the town of, of Piedmont. And these kids were uh, put into school in, uh, in 1935. Well, it was impractical and really impossible to get the kids from Camp Kelsite to Piedmont in the morning and then bring them home at night. So a school bus system was created, a contract school bus system was created. The bus company from Spearfish and a young driver from Sturgis was hired to be the driver. He was, had been on the job two or three days is all. It was in the afternoon, bus load of kids, 21 kids on the bus, taking them back to Camp Calcite, and the bus driver could see up the road to the north, uh, and he was about it where Big Box Elder Creek is, and I don't know exactly what bridge that is today, but uh, in that area, he could see a truck coming at him from, you know, from the other direction, and the truck was weaving in and out of the lane for whatever reason. Um, it was a truck uh, from coming from Belfouche. It was loaded with barrels of molasses. It's a heavy load in it of liquid. And did that contribute to the swaying of the truck? Well, I, I couldn't find any further explanation. Nonetheless, the, the two vehicles were coming at each other and a young bus driver could see that, geez, this guy's way over in my lane. He got across the bridge, the bus driver got across the bridge and decided, I'm going left. So he went into the left lane. The molasses truck was still in the right lane and they sideswept each other um, just north of the bridge abutment. And uh, humongous crash, of course. Six children were killed. They either died directly in the wreck or a couple of them were taken to the hospital in Rapid City and uh, they died that night. The bus driver had a broken arm. The two men in the truck were roughed up in the wreck, but they were, they had no serious uh, injuries. One girl one of the pupils in the bus lived for several days agonizingly in the hospital in Rabbit before she died. So towards seven children were killed in that accident. Well, there was, uh, charges were filed against the driver and the passenger in the truck. The passenger in the truck was the owner of the truck and his hired worker was the driver. They were charged with manslaughter. There's tumult in the community with what happened, why did this happen? Uh, what a horrible thing. And it, oh, geez, it would have been. Um, the, uh, so Judge McNinney of Sturgis changed the venue of the trial to Belfouche. And they had a, a trial that took several days to uh, plead out in the courtroom. The two men were acquitted uh, of manslaughter uh, and the families, of course, that had the children who were either perished in the wreck or, um, or injured just had to grit their teeth and, and uh, got on with life. The CCC camp closed that summer, so it only opened, it only operated one year. Uh, and the, now the CCC men that were there were redistributed to other camps, or a lot of them just went home uh, to their communities in eastern South Dakota. Um, the camp commander was uh, figured very prominently in the recovery of uh, all of the tumult caused by the accident. Um, and then, um, through it all, charges were filed against him for mismanagement of funds at the camp. There was relief money that was raised, whatever, 
and he gets court-martialed. They have the trial at Fort Meade, and he's kicked out of the Army. Um, and so that's the great bus wreck, uh, bus and truck wreck thing. Advocates for safety finally spoke up and said, you know, we know this is a dangerous road. We got to do something about it. This cannot happen again. And so one of the things that they urged them was, you know, something as simple as to paint a white line down the middle of the road. You know, nowadays you think, well, geez, that, of course, that's done with every road, and it is. Um, but um, and it was big news. Uh, back in 1935, to do something to, to soften the heartache of what happened. Well, so that incident goes into the history books, as it were. Then, in 1953, on the same road, a few miles distance, distant further north towards Sturgis, uh, William Pulowski of Sturgis, who ironically was a Cadet, he was a CCC member of Camp Kelsite. By then, he's living in Sturgis and uh, raising a family there. He was giving rides home to Tilford for his son James, Dale Snyder, and sisters Betty Jo and Darlene Krauser. They all lived in Tilford, and so Mr. Pulowski was giving a ride home from school. He was headed south. A guy was headed north in a pickup truck. They crashed head on, and Pulowski, his son, and Dale Snyder were killed, and the two Krauser girls were injured. Um, just like the car bus or the school bus truck wreck, there's a, a trial. The driver of the pickup truck pleaded guilty and uh, served a four-year sentence in the penitentiary in Sioux Falls. Um, he left the state and went to Lander, Wyoming, somehow or another, ended up out there, and uh, was killed, uh, run over by a slow-moving freight train. And when you read the news accounts of that incident in the 1950s, um, left unanswered is a question, was it? Was it suicide, or um, did he trip and fall on the train track, or, or whatever? He's dead. Um, ironically, one of the seven children who died in the school bus accident was a Pulowski. And so Mr. Pulowski, um, he's gone from that family. And the, the, the widow has to carry on. and I'm, I presume that's the same Pulowskis that some of us grew up with here in, uh, in Sturgis. And so um, there's been a lot of heartache on the road. As you can, there are other, um, you know, we could spend the rest of the afternoon or the week probably talking about other horrible things that have happened on the highway. Um, Bob Grams, when I talk to your brother Bill about all this, there's always a Grams story to tell. Your mom and dad and Bill were in a car pickup brick on the road as well. They were going to Piedmont. And uh, your dad had his knee broken, I think. And Bill, who was just a baby, uh, he got roughed up in the wreck as well. And your mom was hurt. Um, and there probably isn't anybody in the audience here who, some way or another, has got a story to tell about the perils of uh, icy roads, accidents, floods, you name it. Uh, it's, it's, it was a tricky ride in those days. So, finally here we get to the construction of the interstate system. And this map from the early or the late 1940s was the, the first map that I could find of the proposed interstate highway system for South Dakota and the region. And you can see, well, you can't see maybe, but I-90 goes all the way across, just like it does today. Uh, I-29 stopped in Sioux Falls. 
and some political muscle had to be exercised. Considerable political muscle was exercised to extend I-29 from Sioux Falls straight north in South Dakota, not over into those rapscallions in Minnesota who they get too much anyway, and we South Dakotans want some of this action. And so the highway got redesigned and the, and the mileage extended. Um, so when South Dakota has a north-south route as well. When the highway, interstate highway system was proposed, six state capitals were not included in the network. And they just were too far away or they were already better served by other roads, um, small states, uh, what have you. And now all the decades later since the construction of the interstate highway system, South Dakota, Missouri, and Delaware remain as the only state capitals that are not connected to the interstate highway system with a designated blue shield interstate highway. There's a four lane road that goes from Vivian to Pier uh, that's built to interstate highway standards, but it's not the interstate highway. Likewise in Delaware, you know, in Delaware you walk across the street and you'd be in another state. Um, the, the capital of Dover is uh, not connected to the interstate highway system. And Jefferson City, Missouri remains isolated as well. Um, you can still get there from here, but uh, not following the blue shields. The, as the projects were getting underway in the 1950s, um, like any big project, giant project, nationwide project, uh, didn't take long for controversy uh, and skullduggery to become part of the mix. And there was a, the Associated Press did a four-part story, series of stories that appeared in newspapers nationwide in the early 1950s, or early 60s, that uh, highlighted some of the difficulties with building the interstate highway system. Uh, you can see from the headlines. Uh, extra points for anyone who can identify the picture of the young man. Um, no? It's Chuck Braden. So, uh, I, I, some heads are nodding. Ah, it's Chuck. Yeah. He's just a boy there. But anyway. Um, so these stories, and they appear day after day. Interestingly, in the Rapid City Journal, so the region's daily newspaper and member of the Associated Press, these stories all appeared on inside pages. It wasn't necessarily good news. Um, and you can see the headlines. Uh, the worst black eye came from Indiana. In Indiana, there was a, there was a big uh, controversy over uh, rights of way and in shady deals with contractors. Um, this is millions of dollars. This is influence. This is all of the things that come along with road building. Um, and so problems are, there's just a natural tendency, inevitability, that they would crop up. Um, there were construction issues with the road, just the quality of the workmanship uh, in various places. Um, so engineering and construction problems. Um, and then the final story was, was the interstate highway system too big for the then Bureau of Roads, as it was called, the federal agency, to manage? It was just too much, too much money, too complex, too many people involved, and so forth. And uh, uh, nowadays, the interstate highway system, more than 40,000 miles of road nationwide, is um, managed by states and federal authorities. There are regional highway authorities in different parts of the country uh, as well, particularly in the small states where the borders are real close together and they just have to cooperate with each other for money 
and uh, the operation of the highways. Some interstate highways have become toll roads again, uh, or portions of them have become toll roads. Um, so there's, there are big implications nationwide. In South Dakota, there certainly were engineering challenges. Uh, and there was the whiff of scandal in the 1970s over bid rigging. Um, and uh, that involved a lot of the contractors in western South Dakota. But by and large, the, the whole execution of the construction of the interstate highway system went off uh, never fast enough, uh, never big enough uh, for every citizen's satisfaction. But you know, it got done. Uh, the hard work of the mostly men and a few women who physically were on the job building the road. Um, and so it got finished from there. Um, when I talked with the resident engineer in Rapid City about all of this, I asked him about rights of way. How difficult was it for the state to buy the property or get title to the property to build the highway? And he explained that by and large, um, a lot of hard negotiating, uh, but they didn't have to go to court to use eminent domain to take anyone's land. Uh, they just table to table talk about uh, the states can offer a dollar an acre and the landowner wants two dollars. Okay, what are we going to do about this? And somehow you have to come together and achieve a solution and stay out of the courtroom, um, which typically uh, never satisfies everybody. And so um, there, were, there was one interesting lawsuit, however, uh, about the construction of I-90, and it involved a Piedmont businessman. Those of you who can remember riding to the, on the old Sturgis Road, and even when the interstate got finished, there wasn't a specific Jersey wall between the interstate and Piedmont. I remember it as a kind of a curb. It wasn't much of a bump uh, in the road. But nonetheless, you had, if you wanted to go to Piedmont, you had to use one of the two exits that served the community. You couldn't go up over the, the curb. Um, Bob, your brother Bill tells me that uh, your mom had to have a hand-drawn map to go home to Piedmont the first few times that she drove from Sturgis and when the exits were created. Now, how do I do this? You know, I'm a grown woman. I have gone to Piedmont all of my life. I, I know how to get there, but now I can't. And I have to take the exit. And so Bill tells me she had a little map that uh, helped her out there until she got accustomed to the way the traffic patterns operated. Um, anyway, this Piedmont businessman and his wife, they owned a, a bar, restaurant, and a little tourist cabin place uh, right in the heart of Piedmont. And they sued to, uh, for monetary damages for loss of business because their customers couldn't just drive off the road and park in front of the Slash J or, or place somewhere there where that establishment operates. And they won in the Meade County Court. And the state appealed the decision to the next higher level, and it got overturned. And the, the state ruling in the, uh, um, I'll read here, the, the major argument, the new interstate highway system represented a changing world. Businesses cannot sue for damages because traffic patterns change. So there you go. It's just tough luck. The, the world time marches on and the roadway changed and your customers are going to have to borrow Jerry Graham's map and uh, get off the road at Piedmont. Regardless of how tempting it might be to just jump that curb and uh, go into the town. This is a 
incomplete list of the contractors that worked on the highways on, on Interstate 90 and other roads here in western South Dakota. Lots of paychecks matriculated through the uh, offices of these companies and thousands, tens of thousands of people employed by these organizations and others uh, to do road building and road maintenance. And these names, some of them, a big fish eats a little fish, and so the companies are constantly consolidating and evolving and um, changing in the way that they, they operate increasingly with, uh, if not international ownership, certainly national ownership of their assets and the, the way that they do their business these days. Still a lot of diesel fuels involved. I was fortunate to talk to uh, as many as I did, I guess, veterans of working on Interstate 90. Uh, I wish I could have talked to more, um, but because uh, there's a, a zillion stories to tell about things that happened. But I talked with Paul Meckling of the, the famed Meckling family of Sturgis. Uh, Paul was a lifelong, career-long employee of the State Highway Department. Uh, largely working in the materials testing department. So he and his colleagues were the guys out there with the shovels and the testing tools that sampled the gravel and the concrete and the asphalt to make sure that the contractors were doing things properly. Um, and um, also involved in the very early days of using those tools and others just to put the stakes out on the on the pasture on the prairies to build the roads um, that nowadays uh, what used to be a four-person survey crew is one person with the pole linked to a satellite uh, and prior to that time they were surveying the way that George Washington ostensibly did his surveying you know with a transit and measuring chains and um, you know, one guy at the transit and then whose turn is it to walk uphill where there's seven rattlesnakes and you've got to put your stick up at the very top of the hill because that's where we that's going to be the radius for the curve or something like that and then the rest of the crew would not be out there with their a knapsack full of stakes and the red tape and the, all that it took to measure the roads and, and lay out the path. Um, the, another thing that Paul did was he was, as he got more senior in his career, he did a lot of the negotiating for sand and gravel and water that had to be purchased from local landowners in order to create the material that got used to build the interstate. There's still an enormous kind of empty gravel pit there where you turn to go to the Snyder Ranch uh, at Tilford, and that will be there forever. Uh, and that, the, the rock, the limestone got dug out of there to build the highway. And there are other gravel pits up and down the road, all, well, frankly, all the way across the state. Um, the uh, Craig Christensen, some of you may know, was another um, college age highway worker and his job and, and Craig grew up in Whitewood and spent some of his tender years working either directly with or close proximity to the uh, loggers that were in Whitewood so he knew how to run a chainsaw and he got hired just as a day laborer as a laborer for one of the construction companies building the interstate from Whitewood to Spearfish and his job by default, because he could run a chainsaw, uh, was to go into the concrete culverts that were built along the road and cut the wooden timbers that were used to hold up the, the wet concrete. Uh, and then once all that had cured, my Craig was in there with a chainsaw uh, cutting out the timbers. And uh, 
said, I got hired the first day that they tested me on the job. I didn't get the saw stuck in the wood like all the other rookies did. And so that became his job for the rest of the summer with no hearing protection, no chaps for his, his legs. Uh, he said, I had gloves, uh, but that was it. You know, that, that was the 1960s. That's the way things were done in those days. And then um, another I-90 construction worker is Dale Lamphere. And Dale uh, was a stake jumper. And who here knows what a stake jumper job title means either. Oh, there aren't any hands going up. Stake, the stake jumper, nearly always a young man, and a young man's job, um, was to go ahead of the road grader and find the blue top grade stakes in the gravel that had been, would have been pounded in by Paul Meckling and Francis Johnson and, and other guys like that that worked for the State Highway Department that with their surveying instruments would set the grade of the road and they pounded these stakes in the ground and they were covered with blue chalk, real bright vivid blue chalk. The road grader operator would come along and make adjustments to the blade. This was all done kind of by the seat of their pants. There was no GPS technology and computer-driven leveling devices or anything like that. And they then would scrape either adding or taking away from the gravel to set the final grade of the road. And once that was done and rolled into a, an appropriate compaction level uh, that would be tested by the state and then tested again in peer to avoid the temptation to buy off or bribe a local tester um, by sending those same samples to peer where a different lab, different people would test the same thing. Um, anyway, the stake jumper found these little stakes in the, in the road and they were a set distance apart. Um, and they, the only tool the stake jumper had in addition to really strong legs and the ability, to, the stamina to do this all day long run usually at a trot ahead of the road grader, find the blue stake, and the tool they had was a hatchet. And they could scratch in the gravel and look for the blue top stake. Once they found it, then they would look back at the grader operator who was watching the stake jumper, and the stake jumper would go up one or down one. They gave hand signals to each other. Um, so that they knew how much gravel to either cut or fill. And um, when I talked to Dale about this, because he was my dad's, or our dad's, uh, stake jumper one summer, uh, and I'm quoting Dale here from our phone conversation, I'm sure that summer helped convince me that a career as a sculptor would be far better and easier than running ahead of the greater blade. Uh, and uh, I had an opportunity to do stake jumping two or three mornings, maybe, when the other stake jumper, I worked on a road construction job, uh, not I-90, um, but got a taste of it, and uh, Dale is absolutely correct. And I can see why engineers and scientists and the computer wizards invented the mechanisms that are on road graders today. If you go by the construction project at Tilford and you see the grader operator there today, why they are, um, they said they kept, there's no steering wheel on the grade, in the grader, it's a joystick, and they're watching the computer screen, and out on the edges of the blades are two, are electronic devices there, get signals from the GPS system that set the grade. And so the job title of state jumper is gone. And, uh, and he was a sculptor. Yeah. And so um, the, uh, there was a reason why the road grader operators uh, were kind of the fighter pilots of the construction crew got paid more than anybody else. Uh, that was a highly skilled job to be able to sit there in the cab 
and look at a 19-year-old uh, sweaty boy uh, out ahead of you, not run over him, uh, and wait for him to find the stake and give a signal up, down, or good. Uh, it, it, nothing was required. Um, that wasn't easy, and it took a no small amount of practice to get good at that. Equipment, um, when we go to Rapid City today, you see it out there. It's not all cat yellow these days. Um, when I came up from Rapid this morning, there are John Deere tractors there. There are tractors made in Korea, uh, Japan, um, other places. Uh, construction equipment has become an international industry uh, these days, but still, most of it's painted yellow and a good bit of it is Caterpillar. Uh, so it's a U.S. made uh, product, U.S. engineering. Uh, the world has lost count of the number of school mice graduates that have gone to work, not only in the road construction industry, but for Caterpillar, uh, as mechanical engineers and designers uh, of things like that. And um, for road building stories, if he ever comes back to town to visit, Sit down and have a beer with Mike Blessing of the Carl Blessing family. Uh, Mike graduated from the school lines and went to work for Caterpillar and became one of their international salesmen. And uh, he can tell some interesting stories of selling bulldozers to Israel and uh, other places uh, and what, it, what was required of him to do that job. Um, the early day road builders, unlike today, um, of course it was, it wasn't seat of the pants engineering, but it was slide rule engineering, it was craft paper. Todd Seaman, who's the resident engineer in Rapid City, said it was uh, guys in white shirts with skinny black ties <laughs> who sat at drafting boards with their slide rules and their pencils and their paper to figure out the cut and fill and the design, uh, the radius of the curves, all of the engineering that it takes to um, build a modern road um, and these days to federal standards. Um, if you've traveled in other parts of the world, particularly in kind of third world uh, or second and a half world countries where highways are not built to the same standard that they are here in the United States, you really do appreciate uh, the investment that taxpayers make in the roads and then all the skill uh, that the engineers and workers have in constructing these uh, elaborate systems that get us safely from point A to point B um, in ways that the people, the South Dakotans of 1920 uh, could only dream or imagine um, how that was going to all work out for them. Interstate 90, you know, was all built out in segments. It gets rebuilt in segments, and it gets repaired in segments. It's an ongoing process. I mean, just for folks who wish for the stretch between Sturgis and Rapid, when are they ever going to get finished? The answer, realistically, is never. It, the barrels and the barricades and the flashing lights and all that are just a permanent part of the highway. That's just how it is. Um, and as money allows, uh, we live in a very unforgiving climate. Um, 18 wheelers can weigh 80,000 pounds. Uh, and that's, that's a lot of punishment that the road has to take in order to get us from point A to point B. So cleaning up after that, redesigning things that need a little tweak one way or another, or big improvements in construction technology and materials come along that uh, mean, well, we're going to do it over again, folks, um, and it'll be better when we're finished. But when that segment's done, well, I'll just move over to the next one, and on and on and on. Um, for us, the first of the interstate high of I-90 uh, was the section in front of Piedmont. That was finished in 1958. 
the last section of I-90 in, in South Dakota was the stretch from Spearfish to the Wyoming line. That's 1976. So 20 years to, to build that 50 miles uh, or more from Piedmont to the Wyoming line. Um, and it's under construction again or reconstruction. Um, the Sturgis segment of I-90 was finished in 1964, and there was a big ceremony on the highway or on the off-ramp at the National Cemetery. And uh, Governor Archie Goober was there, Mayor Langan, Vern Allison was the chairman of the uh, Chamber of Commerce. They were there. Uh, some of us here in the room might have been there in the band, along with me. We we put on our marching band uniforms and we us. It was in November. It was cold. It was windy. We didn't want to be there, but we cooled away to help welcome the governor and uh, the other handful of dignitaries who were there to celebrate the completion of the road. And by July of 1966, you could drive from just west of Sturgis uh, all the way to Wasta on Interstate Highway. And I'm sure if you could peel back the onion of that, you would find political muscle getting flexed by the tourist industry to, uh, as painful as it was to drive on Highway 16 across South Dakota in the early 1960s uh, on the two-lane uh, Highway 16, you could bet that from uh, Wall Wasta into the Black Hills, uh, the tourist industry wanted the road to be done, work properly, uh, and serve the traveling public that was suffered across South Dakota. But then when they finally get to the Black Hills, geez, the roads are really nice. You forget about the stretch that you drove on between Kadoka and Belvedere or somewhere by Mitchell or wherever else where it was still a two-lane highway um, because by the time you got to the Black Hills where you wanted to see Mount Rushmore and the Red Cow Gardens and the Passion Play, why, uh, you're right on a good road and that's the memory you took home. The roadway has... Oh, that's one of my last little bits here. The roadway, and we've all heard these stories, like the Houston's bending the road closer to Wall, the engineering challenges for the completion of Interstate 90 have not been trivial. When the road was being built out on the prairie from about New Underwood East, they were experimenting, the road builders, the construction industry, was experimenting with a technique of mixing lime, pure lime, with gravel. And that was the sub, that was the base for the eventual concrete that went on top. And in doing that, in the way that they created I-90, the right of way for I-90, they, the graders, they, they didn't talk to enough geologists, and they cut the tops off of, of pieces of pure shale, <coughs> gumbo, that were sticking up in the prairie. And so when the lime gravel mixture got put down and the concrete got put down, and then you roll traffic on that, it didn't take very long for parts of Interstate 90 to get, to be a really a dangerous washboard of a, a ribbon of concrete. There were no potholes, it all looked good. But if you were driving across it, it was up and down and up and down and up and down. It caused accidents, um, lots of complaining from citizens, and so they had to re-engineer that uh, to make that repair uh, to the roadway. The stretch between here and Rapid, both of the viaduct um, culverts that carry the interstate highway over the railroad uh, have had to be redesigned. The S curve or curves at Blackhawk had to be completely redesigned. When they were first built, this, the engineers wanted to save some money 
and reuse the, the right of way in the road pit. And so they did that. And that meant they could only build the road to a 50 mile an hour standard. And I don't know, I wasn't living here then, but 10 years ago or more, all of that got rebuilt so that it, the traffic can flow at 75 miles an hour, uh, safely, a posted speed um, for that. Um, the uh, geologists also got involved in fixing the slumping of the ditch on the east side of the interstate, about a, starting at the National Cemetery, going past the uh, truckway station. Um, when the cut and fill was done for that part of the road, um, they didn't take into account, they, or they thought that the hillsides would just stay there forever. We can cut away from the bottom here and uh, nothing will happen. The prairie grass is there, uh, been there since the dawn of time. And while they didn't count on the, how earth here in western South Dakota moves, and so the toe of all that got sliced away in many places, and lo and behold, big cracks started to appear. Um, Blocksburg and further south, east, along the road. And that all had to be repaired. More earth had to be moved in order to make that safe. Um, what's coming up? Well, every time I drive by the, is it home? Hard, I can't say the name of it now. Where the gypsum mines are. Um, where the, hideaway Hills. Hideaway Hills. I don't think we're done with that yet. Uh, and the highway engineers maybe don't want to talk about that or they think, oh, geez, this is another expensive, complicated uh, challenge. The, the guys in the black, the skinny black ties and the white shirts with the calculators now are saying, yeah, well, that's an engineering challenge. Well, let me add it kind of thing. The people who have to pay for that, well, legislators, we taxpayers, uh, and others are going, ooh, uh, this is, this is a big one that's out there that will probably have to be addressed in the coming decades. Um, you can see today, of course, the big construction project at the Pleasant Valley uh, exit and uh, what that means. And that's the first piece of the widening of Interstate 90 to three lanes from Sturgis to exit 67, which is just east of Ellsworth Air Force Base. Um, eventually, in sections, the roadway will be widened out to three lanes. Most of the exits will have to be readjusted uh, and the like. So uh, uh, the orange barrels, it would be a good company to invest in, I think, <laughs> whatever that outfit is that does the safety markings and, and things like that. Um, and two more little stories to tell. Um, when I was in high school and enough of the interstate highway was finished that it became a very tantalizing path to go fast on. Um, the, the fastest I've ever traveled in a motor vehicle uh, was in uh, Marshall Williams' dad's uh, souped up Ford Falcon um, going downhill from the truckway station. Um, I don't know, Ford Falcon speedometers didn't go off into the speed of sound, but uh, we were approaching the speed of sound one night when we were going to Rapid City and uh, the marshal at the wheel and uh, of that car. And then another time in Ron Barker's 1963 Chevrolet Super Sport hardtop um, fancy car uh, going between exit 32 and 31. Um, I asked Ron, is it true that your car will get rubber in all four gears? It could. And uh, with Ron at the wheel. And I don't know how fast we were going by the time we got to exit 31, but we were moving. Um, the other myth, I think, is that there were boys in the Sturgis High School who at the end of the last 
class period of the morning would get in their cars, go to the McDonald's in Rapid City at Bacon Park, and come back to school before the french fries got cold. Um, I don't know that that is uh, mechanically possible, but it was probably tried. And if you were tardy coming back for that uh, first afternoon class, why, uh, you'd have to explain what you were doing to, to uh, Colonel Brown and, and uh, suffer the consequences of that. But I did then talk just recently with retired letter carrier Ron Wise, of Strius, um, who in his lifetime has owned three Corvettes, four, three, still owns one of them. And Ron and some of his buddies, who by then were out of high school, uh, would occasionally challenge themselves or each other uh, after spending a, a wee bit of time in the Night Owl Bar. Let's, I'm hungry, let's go to McDonald's. And so they would get in Ron's Corvette, or he would go by himself, and <laughs> go Rapid City to McDonald's. And maybe in a Corvette you could get home before the French fries got cold. I don't know. But, uh, um, Ron wouldn't, he said he never tested the food there. He did say, however, uh, and if you own three Corvettes, and you're a young man in western South Dakota, you, you do a little high-speed driving that I-90, for as nice a road as it was, and the like, wasn't necessarily Corvette friendly at very high speeds. And he didn't go into just where the speedometer was in his car, but I don't think he was all the way to maximum um, you know, sound breaking speeds. But uh, he had the good sense, and he's very much alive today, um, to not push his car to the absolute limit. And, you know, a McDonald's French fry when it's cold isn't much different from a hot one in, in some respects, you know, with, a, with enough ketchup and, and whatever. So, uh, anyone in the audience know, can they verify of a high school student doing the same thing in their hot rod car? Or, uh, I, don't, I don't see any takers on that one. But it, it certainly was a myth when I was growing up. Uh, it was part of the deal that you could do. I do know that the, inter, the completion of enough of Interstate 90 to make it a relatively safe road to travel on was part of the key for me and other teenagers that uh, we could go to the movies in Rapid City uh, without having to sneak there. And um, because the, our parents just, well, the road is so much better now. And it was. Um, and you could get home safely and not have to suffer the fate of so many others that have had horrible accidents uh, on the highway. Um, one other road that was important or has been important in South Dakota or in Sturgis is Highway 34. When it took forever uh, for the state legislature to finally have enough money to pay for pavement on Highway 34. It wasn't finished until 1963, where you could drive on pavement from Sturgis all the way to Pier. Uh, and to celebrate that legislative and engineering accomplishment, a big celebration was held and they had a caravan of classic cars drive from Pier to Sturgis, where they had a big banquet and a big whoop de doo to <coughs> pardon me, celebrate this accomplishment. And the two Sturgis motorists didn't drive these cars, but these are pictures of the cars that they were driving. Um, they, uh, so I don't mess up the names here. Um, Plainview resident William Henry Mackay had a 1928 Studebaker Dictator. That was the model name for that car. And um, a man named Harold Philpar, who I think had a garage here in Sturgis, um, he had the 1919 Hudson Speedster. 
And they made the trip. Well, one day, no flat tires. It was a new road. Why not? You know? And that was the celebration uh, for the community. So where do we go beyond? This, uh, the highway department looked into their crystal ball. This is, uh, this is exit 32 in 50 years. Just, just get over it, folks. It's coming. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, exit 31 will be a duplicate of this. Uh, I'm teasing. Who knows what 32 and 31 will look like in 50 years when rally goers are coming on their GPS automated electric motorcycles. And the last Harley Davidsons will be towed here uh, and started once, you know, just so you can listen for a little bit. And, uh, and the tattoo removal partners will be going uh, at full speed here in Sturgis in 50 years. This is a picture of what is called the mixing bowl south of Washington, D.C. I have driven on this road a good bit. Um, it is a challenge. Instrument flight rules are required at all times. You've got to pay attention when, when you're on this highway. Um, but this is tangled up as all of that looks. It functions very well. Tribute to civil engineering in America. Um, and uh, at its widest, it is 24 lanes, if you count everything. Um, so an enormous project cost $676 million to build. Five men were killed doing the project over a course of about 10 years to build it all out. Um, but it works. Uh, works well enough that there is a hotel at the bottom of the picture and a little bit to the left. There's a 10-story hotel suburban hotel and it has a rooftop bar and a party room and all of that. When this project was under construction, the U.S. State Department would bring diplomats, particularly from third world countries and from China, to a cocktail party on the 10th floor of that hotel to look over this engineering marvel. Uh, fear this, the rest of the world. Here in America, we know how to build roads, and we do. Uh, we, we get it done. So uh, anyway, it, uh, that's the mixing bowl. Denver has its mousetrap. Uh, major cities around the nation all have versions of this, one way or another, where uh, highway engineers, uh, the pain becomes so great that they finally put up the money and the effort to rebuild the road, and that's, that's what you get. So maybe in 50 years, our exit uh, 32 will look like that. Right now, this is where we are with the construction. Three lanes in both directions. Um, and I think that in, in our hearts of hearts, and, those of us who appreciate small town Sturgis, we're always going to be a two exit town. And for me, that's good enough. Um, we'll hope that uh, 32 and 31 don't become a mixing bowl or a snarl of concrete and steel, but um, it's how we get from here to there safely, uh, all day, every day, uh, increasingly in all kinds of weather that we wouldn't have thought of 50 years ago. Uh, it just was too risky to, to drive. And now you get on the interstate and you still slide off the road when you're going by the truck way station. But uh, you've got a cell phone now, so you can call for a record to come and pull you out. And, uh, um, and you still hit deer and occasionally vehicles ding into each other. Horrible things happen on the road from time to time but it is dramatically different, and it's where we are. So I thank you for listening to my ramblings here today. Um, if any of you have more, oh, uh, if you have more uh, highway stories or changes or corrections to what I've done here, please 
uh, let me know uh, these things that I work on never end. I'm still doing sheriffs in Meade County and I'll never stop uh, researching that story. So anyway, thank you for coming. There's another program coming right behind me and uh, it's going to be still about transportation but dramatically different from what I've talked about. So again, thanks. Travel safely when you go home.